Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. for passionate founders, ambitious entrepreneurs, and pioneering startups by actually giving a shit about them, their brands, and their customers. Please welcome the CEO of InstantlyRelevant.com, Thomas Helprick. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have Thomas Helprick. Thomas, how are we doing? I'm good. Is it is it 50 shades, 60? Yeah, I mean, no, I'm actually like 51. So for those individuals yeah. at home, I'm just one more. Just letting you all know, know. One more than Christian Gray. One more than Christian Gray. Now, Thomas, we've been chatting actually before this show start. I'm really excited about it because I think you have a lot of great, great information that you're about to share. But before we get into all of that, give the listeners at home a little background. Who is Thomas? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. This is very cool uh, to come on the show. Uh, Thomas Elfrick, right? Uh, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, you know, uh, modern day here. I've, I founded a company called Instantly Relevant a couple of years ago, uh, where we really focus on lead generation, in particular around LinkedIn. Uh, backing it up a bit, you know, I kind of grew up in the Midwest, St. Louis, uh, and, you know, spent a long time there. Went to school at Indiana University. Uh, studied, uh, was at the Kelly School of Business there. Uh, and, you know, came out right at the end of the, kind of the tail end of the dot-com. And, and so I, I definitely remember myself being a much better developer than I was. Um, but that's that's what you do when you're older. You remember how good you were at things that you probably weren't that good at. <laughs> and but I always did. T- I always found that I talked well about technology, and in particular about how it impacted what the business function was, and then the technical levels of what was going to need to change to get there. That takes you on that consulting path. So that takes you on that you know advisory trip through you know KPMGs, PwCs of the world, and and you know along that way. Uh, you know, I developed an expertise around intelligent automation and AI systems. So all this kind of hype on chat GPT, like our company has been leveraging that stuff for open AI's beta platform for almost three years now. So really get it well. Um, I think my other name is AI nerd. So if you Google AI nerd, <laughs> you'll find a whole YouTube channel on AI. So if you really want to nerd it out, sometimes we can, but, uh, but that, so that took me this expertise and, and during that kind of journey uh, through it, I, I discovered, um, you know, the challenges with, with marketing and lead generation and how inefficient it was and how effective it was and how much just shadiness and just not good behaviors and no consultative effort. And so I formed a company around the principles of intelligent automation, where you accelerate a human with the right technology, right human, right moment. And we apply it to this rule to help uh, marketing be more effective to find leads. And uh, that's pretty much my whole life story. There's some golfing events and probably no real arrests or anything. <laughs> <Got it. laughs> Got to get the golf in good. there and, yeah, try to not get arrested every couple of weekends, you know. Not right, every I know while golfing. That's what I was yeah, especially like, at golfing, golfing, I think that's, that's, that's actually the most concerning part is actually fearful of getting, getting pulled over after the golfing. <laughs> I, I claim or disclose nothing. Exactly. <laughs> so for the listeners at home, you mentioned it. What is kind of, let's go in a little bit more detail and, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, Jack. Chat GPT, because I think it's really uh, important for these folks to know. I was just getting schooled about this earlier. But first, what is Instant Relevant? Yeah, so Instantly Relevant, it's, it's a, it's a, we're a digital agency, but we're specifically focused on, uh, the, the, our highest competency is around finding LinkedIn lead generation. And it's not typical to how most companies who are doing this do this, where they mass email or mass email people, or they endlessly spam people uh, in their inbox. Uh, the way that I've built my network from about you know 8,000 people two and a half years ago to 173,000 in followers is in a very short period is is through is through the methods we do for our customers and quite simply what we do is we 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 work with you to figure out who your ideal customer profile is or persona you want to meet or should meet is make sure your branding all the other little you know blocking and tackling all those things are done so when people you know check out your profile you're in a good spot but in the, the day we end up commenting on your targeted list posts and create a inbound effect. And so when people check you out after that, you've given them some, you know, proper comments, some actual attention, we just make sure your profiles are also set up to convert. 
And then we take the messaging from there to get people to come do your call to action. So we typically focus on B2B services um, or higher tickets uh, items because where there's a relationship involved where you need to be, it's more, you have to be more than known, like, and trusted to buy. Like that's what everyone thinks known, like trust, right? But it's actually not enough. You have to be relevant too. Cause I, I may really know and like you and, and you know, but what you're selling, I have no use for because it's not relevant. I'm never going to buy. So you have to be relevant as well. So when you combine outreach of commenting messages, good content, you know, you, you manage your social media and keep it consistent and you combine that with then um, having a list of people that, that really care and your, your, your profiles are set up, people inbound find you and they, they ask you what you do and you, you go from there into your sales funnel. So it's really effective. Um, it is certainly for those who are more strategic in nature and want to really get leads consistently over time. Yeah. And let's, let's talk a little bit about your growth first, uh, because you mentioned you use certain certain products to kind of help fill this growth, fuel this growth. What are those things that you know entrepreneurs can use right now? Products that are out there readily available to them, and why are they important to them? It's a it's a loaded question. You probably could do a whole series of podcasts, today, true, but yes. I will give you the short answer. You should always be learning new technologies that could enable, but watch out for technology fatigue. And I'll come back to that. But you're, there's a lot of choices. At the end of the day, though, I would definitely be leveraging uh, something on the chat GPT side right now to help create your content. I would not turn that on automated with just take it and post it. I would put your own brand, your own words, your own uh, thoughts somewhere in there, but just leverage it as a tool. It's a great accelerator. We use it all the time, but it's still human led. The other things are like all the little things you need to do between Calendly, Otter, you know, to help do note taking. We were discussing Fathom.video, and it's a, it's a thing that plugs into Zoom that allows you just to take highlights of what someone's saying. And when you do that, you can speed up your social media builds and all the other things. All those are important. Uh, making sure you're leveraging like Zapiers and, and, and with your CRMs and your Mailchimp's of the world. It it's a um, it's having a technology stack that will automate as many of the pieces as possible that need to be, but allow you the touch points to keep keep the human on the on the pulse of your of your customers. I'm speaking specifically about a lot of, like I said, B2B services, longer sales cycle type relationships. On B2C, write some great copy, great visuals, get a good landing page and, and rock the Google ads and get out there and, and learn that game. That's a, it's a slightly different uh, play, but the, but what we find that the, that the harder leads to find are the B2B side. So that's where we focus it. Yeah. And I would say most of the entrepreneurs, you know, especially those small businesses that are just starting, starting out are really focused on that B2B side. Now you kind of talked about automation a little bit briefly. Talk about the importance of like, I, I'm just kind of getting into it. So I would love to hear your perspective. What is the, why is automation so important for an entrepreneur? Automation will speed up your, uh, the mundane, right? The things that you still need to take care of. Uh, and, and it, you know, if the process is done correctly, it'll enable you to have more headspace, more time to work on higher value activities like sales or product development or engineering or whatever, whatever have you depends your, on your uh, business. Uh, I will say you should use automation with carefulness. So I wouldn't leverage automation fully on, let's say a LinkedIn profile. First of all, you're going to get likely flagged and, put through LinkedIn jail. Um, you may want to use it for some aspects of it from, you know, endorsements or something like that. There's, there, there's ways to do that. And it's a much longer conversation. You should leverage it correctly with the idea that it's there to not replace your outreach, not replace your generation, but to just enable it a little bit better. Uh, but automation on things like, uh, you know, when you have a customer list and they've said, you know, Hey, I'd love you to email me or whatever it is. Yeah. You should have some kind of drip campaigns and those kind of things that, that work um, on that. But I will tell you, it depends on your business. Sometimes it's better to send 10 really good emails in a week than it is to send a thousand automated ones. Because here's a tip I'd give you anybody starting a business. Uh, when you automate things or when you do, let's say, for example, cold email outreach, I'm not a big fan of it. And, and the reason is it has, it's effective when some people really know their market. They have great copy. They know what they're, but that is not, that is the exception to the rule. Most people have terrible copy, have very mediocre web pages or landing pages their personal brand and their their company brand is is, is maybe okay at best. And the, but you don't think it is, but just the, the truth of the matter, it doesn't work because uh, those fundamentals aren't in place. And so when you go do a cold, out meal, e cold email outreach, and let's say you send 5,000 emails and 100 people raise their hands and say, yeah, I want it. You're kind of happy, but you have to also realize you just spam 4,900 people. And so over time, you're slowly bleeding your brand as a spam brand. And, and that's just not a good sustainable place to be. I would, I would say it's better to get them warmed up, get them to get to know you, be inbound interest, and then you're not spamming anybody. They're coming to you for the piece. So it's a slightly different thinking, but I would not start 
with cold email marketing when you first start as an entrepreneur, or even if you're into it a little bit without these other things in place, you just you're chipping away at a brand that you probably worked really hard to build to. So what would you say to an entrepreneur is, is basically if they use AI often, is AI enough for creating content? It's not enough. It's a really good choice. And it, uh, it, it it's something that has to be part of your kind of stack day to day. But it's it's not the only answer. It, it's not there where it's going to do all of it for you. It's going to do a lot. It's going to accelerate you. You do need a lot of you. I, I would tell you to try to leverage it, get it, feel what you can do with it. And then, but at the end of the day, it's probably not your core competency. So go outsource that to people who really know, like an organization. Um, I can shamelessly plug mine here, but the truth is. Plug you it could, away, plug it. Yeah, I mean, you could go to instantlyrelevant.com. <laughs> uh, instantlyrelevant.com is not sponsoring it today. They are not. Instantly but they will relevant. be on the newsletter. So go visit the shades of e.com. Go ahead and subscribe to the newsletter. We will have this information. So I, I tell people, it depends on where you are in your journey and your kind of season of entrepreneurship. Um, you should outsource things that are not core and to, to people who know what they're doing and, and, and leverage that time savings for the investment because there should be some type of ROI on it. And I will tell you that you get your expectations right. When you're doing things correctly, they don't typically happen overnight. It, you may get a couple of quick wins, whatever else, but anybody who's promising you overnight success is, is really, it should be an immediate flag. Um, there's just in particular with with social media, with likes and follows and views, people can trick that with bots and other you know things very quickly, and it doesn't get you anything. It'll make you feel better. You get all these likes and views, but you'll you won't actually build any business from it. And so, the relevance piece of the network you build and the content you create and the outreach you do matters way more, and it's it's way more effective for a long standing business that actually wants to grow and you know and, and create the growth and kind of um, capital assets it's going to need to kind of continue. You know, that's a great point. And, you know, a great example is this podcast. I think, you know, the growth of this podcast at the beginning is we're on you know, over episode over 100, been doing it for two years, continuously learning and networking with the entrepreneurs we listen to, even just today with Thomas getting information about, you know, chat, uh, chat, GTP and, and you know, uh, Fathom video, these things really trying to improve what I'm doing uh, as well, because I do want to create a company that's very sustainable. And that's why we established that nonprofit Latino founders, where we really are supporting, you know, our underserved entrepreneurs here in the Pacific Northwest. But you, you kind of talked about branding also, uh, in fact, quite a bit of brand, about branding. Where do most brands go wrong with social media when their social media approach? <laughs> most brands go wrong by focusing on themselves. So we do this our um, it's in, and a lot of them go super cliche. So those are kind of the two main things. And when you mix them both, it's just lovely, right? We are awesome. You know, we are the, you know, so the, the brand and what you do has to really, you know, reflect what it is, is your culture and what you're delivering. Um, and probably the third element, typically brands get way too wide, too fast. So the narrower you can stay and deeper of a, of a segment you, you serve, especially when you're a smaller business, the better you're going to be, cause you're going to be able to repeat it. Um, and so where they go wrong on social media is talking about themselves endlessly. There's a mix between what people to get someone to interact with you. You're going to, you're going to have to give them the attention first and you have to do it in a very uh, non salesy way. And if you're out there as a business doing it, you know, the algorithms also are not going to share any of your posts because they want you to pay. So you're going to have to leverage the, probably the biggest mistakes. People don't leverage their personal profiles well enough and they don't take them seriously enough to make them really effective uh, set up to convert, you know, in, in, highly uh, attractive for people to want to connect to other people and particularly in the early days, because people are going to check out your company. They're going to check you out. And if you don't check out, then they kind of go the other way. So to take, take attention to your personal brand image, what we call it, your executive eminence, which is how you look, what you're saying, your thought leadership you put out there. Um, those things matter in the sales cycle quite a bit um, for especially earlier stage companies and companies of with the owner still, the owner founder still kind of at the helm. And so how does one do that? How does an entrepreneur create meaningful content, you know, either on their personal brand or their, their or personal site or their person or their uh, actual brand? It, it, well, our approach is, you know, there's, there's all kinds, but our, our approach is to focus on the challenges your customers face, um, the, the industry faces and, and talk about solving how those problems affect people or how they solve, how they're solvable. And not without actually mentioning that you solve it um, because then it becomes salesy. If, you, if you're just talking about, and you know yourself what you do then then you're you're it's people are going to dismiss it as not thought leadership and more of a sales collateral 
And so focus on the problem and that, that, that exists, which means you got to know your industry. You got to know your customer really well. You got to know what it is and how you align to it and your point of view on that. If you do that, that will resonate with your customer base a lot better. You, and not to say you shouldn't have some sales things. Hey, we do those things. You should have call to actions that are simple. And if you'd like to learn more, but be creative with it without it being too much in your face. You know, one of the things I think we've been hearing a lot on the news recently, we've talked about automation, we talk about AI. Is AI is something to be feared for by an entrepreneur? Oh, no. I mean, if you fear it, I, you've watched Terminator too many times. Think, but um, <laughs> There's probably better movies. I'm dating myself. It's such a good movie. It's a great movie. It it's is. a great movie. So I might be dating uh, myself too, folks, but Terminator's great. It was, it was good. It was for, for what, what time it was, it's still, it's still watchable. Um, but no, if you, if you fear it, it's, it's, it's probably a bigger, more systemic problem of uh, fear of change or, you know, not being willing to try to learn something new. That's a bigger, that's a much bigger problem. So if anything new or learning something new bugs you, that's going to be a habit you got to break. I mean, that's entrepreneurs are ferocious readers and knowledge. They devour knowledge, right? I mean, they just bring it in. And if you're not doing that, you're getting behind. So don't, so leverage these technologies to, to accelerate you. And I, and I encourage people like, you know, the chat GPT, though it's terribly branded by name, it's, um, it's easy. They made it in a way that you're talking like to a human and you should treat it. Don't use it like Google. Use it like, you know, ask it to take the, pers- you know, you can use it to say, take the perspective as a customer in this thing. And they're, you're looking for this. What would the questions you'd have, or, you know, or be play devil's advocate to what I put here and ask questions back of what would be concerning. It does a really good job with helping you think through some of the challenges and problems um, in real time. And so like, you should be leveraging these technologies to create content, to accelerate your, you know, your books, your back end, all this stuff. And, uh, but don't be afraid of it. That, that's, that would be a bad problem. To... Yeah. And I, I agree. I've been leveraging, you know, calendarly uh, to schedule uh, opportunities to schedule my interviews using Otter, using Canva, using, you know, all these different opportunities. LinkedIn even now has the opportunity to um, schedule your posts, right? Pre-schedule posts. Uh, Facebook Meta has that opportunity as well. Leveraging, I think these are, are very good, uh, good smart um, ideas. In fact, Thomas, one of the things you're mentioning too is for entrepreneurs to kind of, you know, Sanjeev Lumba, former guest, says this very well, stop focusing on the me and start focusing on the you. Cause that's mm-hmm. how you create value back to your consumer. Right. And it seems that's, that's kind of where your team kind of focuses on. How did you build your team? How did you build this company, you know, uh, instantly relevant? Uh, well, we, we, you started with the first one, right? So, you know, you have your vision, you, you know, you, what you want to do as a company. And uh, back then it was like, I was like, man, I, I really, at that point, right. So it wasn't just a company. It was more of a thing. I've, I think I should outskit source my content creation and manage my, that was my initial thought before, before we started the company even. And so I found somebody um, through uh, tons of interviews on Upwork, I believe it was, um, which I'm, I tell people to go do it, but man, your consistency is going to be all over the map for a number of reasons, but went through a few countries, few several people in interviews, but I found somebody who just kind of impressed me and they showed some other promise. And, and he's been with me the, uh, uh, as my kind of leads my operations of uh, it in the in the philippines now for almost three years um and and so that's how i found the initial one then after that i said hey who do you know and then we brought people in that were kind of known and trusted some work some don't but we built people through word of mouth reputation and and and, and then execution and so you have to build that you have but you have to build processes in place to help people follow it now you get it i don't get it right every time there's plenty of improvement and it becomes one of those things you do later but the earlier you can have a repeatable process um, especially if that's your skill set, go create one and let people follow it and then improve it. Um, it's definitely one of my weaknesses, but that's why I hired this guy to help me do it. So, but that's how we built the team was, was kind of piece by piece. Now, the other piece is getting the right people lined up to your services of what you're doing um, and where they their acumen for technology exists. So I, I make sure that people understand tech, they know how to use it in the cycle to accelerate and their, and their um, you know, impeccable customer service, those kind of things. Are, those are the highest who you are, how you act, how you behave, your propensity to learn or higher value than anything else on, on our team. Yeah, you know, mentioning uh, trying to get your service out into the right, in front of the right people. Who is the typical client for your business? We really serve well. Uh, I mean, we, we have a range, right? So we do have the range of the solopreneur that's, you know, a startup founder or coach that's looking for more leads to, you know, uh, one of the unicorn, you know, multi-billion dollar valued company. But we do a very specific thing for them with content creation or, or some specific lead generation. Uh, ours are really CEOs and founders 
that need an edge to find leads and they need appointment set and they need to do it in a way that doesn't destroy their brand or become spammy or, or kind of sleazy. They need, they're, they're strategic in mind. They're typically maybe, you know, hundred or less people in employment. And uh, though we have a, a few international, we've really kind of honed in on the U S market because they're um, they get it. They, they understand what to do with it and they know it's competitive. Uh, that's it. The, the founder, smaller company that's funded, doing well, that just needs to grow, needs scale. And they don't want to hire. When people hire us, they get a whole marketing team in addition to lead generation. So you get like 13 roles available to you. Uh, and our idea was let's charge less than one full-time employee for that. Beautiful. And folks, and again, I'm not, this is not sponsored by Instant Relevant, but please, please go ahead and look up this information. Again, if you find value in this conversation with myself and Thomas, and I'm happy to connect you with Thomas and his team as well. I'm happy to share that information. Again, check out the newsletter. Now, Thomas, what has been difficult about creating this company, about being an entrepreneur? Well, you know, I'm, I start at mid 40s. You got three kids. You got mortgage payments. You know, we've done a really good job to manage down debt and all the things there. But you have the hardest part's been, uh, you know, going from making really good money in the corporate world and never really liking it to so to a to a founder, right? So. Uh, I'm writing a book on this topic called never been promoted because I've never been promoted. So if you've never been promoted, don't worry about it. It's okay. You're going to be fine. I don't think you want it anyway. I can explain that later. But the point is, you know, as I go through the seasons of life, right. Of, of especially entrepreneurship in, 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 in <laughs> I have to tell you, so I think there's like three parts to, to an entrepreneur's life is this unraveling, unbounding and unleashing. And on the unraveling pieces where you're, probably working somewhere, you just got laid off, you're trying to figure out who you are, what you could become, what you can't do, what you like, what you don't like. And you're just in, in, in do I have what it takes to become an entrepreneur? And that first phase is, is, is fun, because you're like excited, and likely you're, you know, you're still like, you know, still working, or you, you still got some money left. <laughs> so you're, and that's the ideation phase. And, and once you figure that out, then you go in this kind of unbound piece. And the unbound stage is where you have roadblocks, you have excuses, you have fear, you have people that you probably should stop hanging out with. You have lots of things in your way. And that's a really rough one because there's a lot of emotional pieces with that. And there's a lot of self-realization and vulnerability and fear. And the last part being unleash where you're, you're, there's no safety net. You are the entrepreneur. But in that phase, which is, seems very scary, is that you also realize you never had security where you were working. You had, you, it's, you have it in your own abilities. And as soon as you trust and get behind that, you have it. So I, I part of what we do with all of our customers is uh, we take them through that journey and, and I coach them with it as they, and some do marketing, some just do the coaching, but uh, it's so important to understand those pieces because the difficult pieces are found in each of those phases. And oftentimes you're the reason they're difficult. You, it's your own biases, your own self-reflection, your lack of ability to talk about, you know, like uh, vulnerability or, the, or how you feel or the burnout you're going to feel, um, or you're unwilling to go talk to a counselor. I mean, there's <laughs> like, you've got to open it up. You've got to balance your mind and you got to, you know, not that I'm a good specimen. You should do some push-ups occasionally. There's, that's the hard part is balancing life while you do it. And uh, you, you do need a coach. You need a mentor. And, and I've had one informally. I probably would have been smarter to hire one earlier, but um, that's the hard part is, is getting out of your own way. You know, that is very true. In fact, you know, men, having a mentor is so important, folks. I'll be completely honest with you. Uh, mental health crisis is a real thing. Please very check up on yourself, check up on your friends and your family. I have a mentor. Um, I'll be completely transparent. I was being recruited by a national healthcare system across the country. I went through the process, got the offer, had the interview, called my mentor, uh, and, and I was like, "Hey, you know, I'm going through this this phase of my life. You know, what should I be doing?" And he really dropped some really good information, good knowledge on me. Uh, he really kind of asked me, "Okay, what's important in life?" You know, I started drilling down. Okay, well, you know, I don't want to travel as much, but I want to make some more money. You know, be financially uh, secure for my family, and you know, don't want to travel because I want to be close to my family and so on and so forth. And he's like, "Okay, so it seems like family is one of your priorities." He's like, "Let me let me ask you this." He's like, "What can you do at this organization that is truly going to create a generational impact? Will you will you go at this organization? You'll create this." company or you create this department, right? That's what you're being recruited for. And then you're going to leave in 10 years and somebody else is going to come in and they're going to redo it and they're going to have their own likes and images. Okay. So your, your resume maybe is going to last 10 to 20 years, but being a family man, being with your family, being a father with your kids, that has the opportunity of having a three generational impact. You're impacting your kids, 
They're going to impact your kids' kids. And if we live long enough, we may impact our kids' kids' kids. That's three generations. And so that put everything in importance for me, right? Where it was mm-hmm. like, okay, um, again, this is, if you can name, there's some of the biggest national healthcare institute, and this was the biggest. Uh, this was probably the, my, my creme de la creme. It was, it was the one, right? And, but I think it's the importance of it is understanding what you believe is valuable as well. In fact, I'm very interested to hear from you, Thomas. You were in corporate America. Why did you start this company? Huh. I got asked to leave my job too many times. Is really the truth. <laughs> um, I mean, I went from being um, like a, you know, I had a really weird, crazy career ride where uh, I, I've probably, I think the one place I've stayed the longest is probably four years. And it was the worst working environment I've ever had. I think I had like seven different bosses and I was just trying to like, you know, new a young father and, oh, I hated being, I'm not gonna say where it was, but um, the, the every, I've been like maybe 12 months to 30 months anywhere. And I went on this kind of crazy career ride because of this intelligent automation push and AI systems, these kind of pushes to go from like a manager at KPMG to the chief innovation officer of nearly a billion dollar services company. Um, and it, you know, you're making like crazy money. You're making ha- over a half million a year. Like, you know, like people, oh my God, that's, a, but when you get there and it's great money, tomorrow, but I wasn't really, I was happy, but I was also like, there's still that itch of like, I don't want to work for someone else's dream. And I, I mean, like, trust me, that is a messed up thing when you're like, I hit the D job I wanted to hit in my early forties. And, it, it, and, and I didn't self, I didn't tank it. Don't get me wrong, but I was doing fine and doing well there. But all of a sudden it ended two weeks after getting a bonus, my sixth quarterly bonus in a row, like everything's fine. All of a sudden the value wasn't there according to the, you know, the owners and the leadership. And I was like, where does that come from? And it just gave me an idea. Like, and that's, this is like, you know, so go from that number over half a million to zero. <laughs> <laughs> and and then you go to startup land and then COVID hits and next you know you're a home repair guy with a 18 inch gauge nail through your finger. This oh my true. goodness. And that's not when the epiphany happens, by the way, because you become home repair guys. What happens when you go? And so it's not when you have an 18 gauge nail. And that's not a big nail, but it is not small either. And you're pinned to the wall. I used to be like Jesus Christ, but that seems a bit a little forthcoming. That's not when the epiphany happens. It's it's when you pull the nail out and you don't bleed. And you're like, well, that is surprising. I'm with my internally bleeding. It didn't even really hurt. It just made a sound like I was like, oh, like it's a, a sound where my kids were like, well, Daddy, are you okay? like it was a that's not the epiphany. The epiphany, and that, and I'm sitting there with a nail in my finger and I'm looking at it and I'm like, that was the epiphany. I was like, I'm holding it. And I'm like, what am I having a nail in my finger for? Now I know AI well. Like, what is it? What did I miss? So I took some a few weeks and, and that's how AI nerd got started, that YouTube channel during uh COVID. I, and I've since kind of pulled back from it because there's no monetization path on. I was just having fun with it. But the truth is I was like, there's got to be a better way to do marketing and sales because I was, you're always, so it, so people out there, you're entrepreneurs, right? One thing that drove me nuts in corporate world was like, I was always waiting for the lead to go do something with it from sales or marketing or whomever. And all they were good at was telling me how great they were doing in metrics or how many people they had working on the problem, but never actually delivering anything in. And so I just solved that problem. So when I started this company. I was working for a company prior and I'm sorry. I was, I bought, started this company and then I got hired because of all this content I was creating. And I, and I, and I took the job because like I had a whole team to go generate leads for myself to generate interest. And because I solved it on my own, I didn't have to worry about sales or anything else. I just started building. Uh, and and the, the thing that really made me blew my mind is that bugged the company I was with. It bugged them that I had a team that was working for me that I paid myself to go get me leads because their sales teams couldn't. And, and like that ended up, you know, killing the relationship after about 20 months. But it's like, but you're not provide. So this is my point is you have to just take the initiative yourself. You, you just have to get out there and, you know, and solve it. You're going to have to find your, your methods to grow your business. And there's no excuses. You're the only one, honestly, you have a team, you get it all that, but you're on the hook for it. End of the day, you're on the hook. So get it done. That's a very, very good point. Have you ever had a moment of self-doubt? Oh, every 14 minutes. I'm halfway through this interview. I almost hung up twice. <laughs> Here's the day of an entrepreneur. If, you, if you're a new person, if you're an entrepreneur, listen up. And because if I miss a part step, let me know. All right. You wake up. You are fired up because you're going to get downstairs. You got some meetings today. You're going to work on, you know, the landing page. You're going to go talk about you think about your brand. You get your co- You get the kids out. Maybe, you know, you get your coffee. You take the dog for a walk, whatever you got. You're down there and you're rocking it. And, you know, and then, you know, and it's, you know, it's morning. And, and next thing you know, you're like, oh, my God. I really need to do this. And you're kind of getting ADD and you bring it back together. You start working through it. And all of a sudden somebody cancels a meeting. You're bummed out. You're like, fuck this. I'm going to go 
apply for four jobs. You go apply for four jobs on LinkedIn. No one ever calls you back. You know, they're not going to, you have the word entrepreneur on your LinkedIn and you go there and then you're like, Oh, it's the greatest. You know what? I, I feel like another coffee, you get coffee, you come back. Then somebody else schedules a new meeting. You're like, sweet. Yes. This is the greatest. You have your next one. You're like, Oh, that didn't really go well, man. I feel like I need a nap. You take a nap, you get back up, you have your coffee and it's 11 AM. And so it's, <laughs> that's just the morning. And then you repeat it in the evening. And throughout that whole time, you're like, why did I do this? I don't make enough. I used to make more. I can, I can see the path. I'm going to get the Excel book out. Let me go see how much I'm going to make when I'm successful. You're all over. And so at the end of the day, though, none of that shit matters. Just get in, focus on one thing at a time and just do it really well. And the next hour, I don't know. And so that's, yes, that's a long-winded, fun answer of there's self-doubt all the time, but like that's normal. That's how you discover. When you have self-doubt, you should ask yourself why. And there's usually because there's something off, like, you know, your product, or your service, your offering is not right. Or, you know, you're charging too little or too much or, you, 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 you know, you're there's something there. Really, that's that vulnerable. Take, take it in. Discover what that why you have self-doubt. That, that is a great point. You know, you, it's kind of interesting because you came from you mentioned you came from corporate America. Then you're doing entrepreneurship. What has, has there been anything easy about this transition? I mean, it's easy to get laid off. I just tell you to go. So it's, you just uh, <laughs> ship your computer in at some point. And oh, shit, that's it. I walked into that. <laughs> um, I will tell you, it's not an easy path. So it's, it's so entrepreneurship is you, as anybody's a but small, it, it's, it's an exception if, if it's easy. Um, if it's easy, it's because you're very good at some things that, that typically, um, you know, you have strengths and weaknesses, right. And, and the more you're reflective of what those are and it, then, then it gets easier but you really have to like understand it's not going to be an easy journey. It, but I will tell you, every day I work, I work my ass off, and I don't feel like I'm working anymore. I feel like I'm I actually have fun, um, you know, being an entrepreneur, being here. And, and what what you want though is to make enough to pay your bills, to have money left over to save. To no one can afford healthcare in the United States, so just accept that that's not going to happen. Um, but I will. I, I'm going to give it entrepreneur. If, they, if you've made it this point, this is one thing that's been super effective. For me to offstain burnout and uh, keep keep fresh thinking is I take every Wednesday, I wouldn't say off, but there's no meetings. It's uh, it's my learn day. So I'll go learn. It might be anywhere from going fishing or to learning Google Analytics. And the idea is don't take any meetings that day at all. And then you created yourself a Saturday in the middle of your week that no one expects you to have off and take it to go walk, take it to go do other things. That break make you go much harder on Mondays and Tuesdays and uh, Thursdays and Fridays. Uh, and it, it would also lines to our culture because our teams all get four day work weeks. So I did that from day one. I was like, you know what? You need time with family. You need time to have fun. You want to go do a side hustle, go do it. But when you're working, work your butt off, but then check out. And so, uh, but take that Wednesday, take it off, take one day a week. I, I do recommend the Wednesday though, because it's like, it's perfect. It's yeah. just like two days on one day off, two days on you know, two days off and then you repeat it and it's like, Oh, it's, it's a better way to live. Yeah. It sounds, and I think that's what you're probably starting to see too, is these alternative work days, especially since the pandemic. Um, and it, it's, it is, it's, I, I truly, I'm able to take some time off. Uh, thankfully I work for an organization that really supports uh, a good, well, a uh, good a life balance. Um, but granted when I'm working, I'm busting my ass. Like, you know, me and Thomas were mentioning, uh, after, you know, I'm, I'm working today. Uh, I gotta, I gotta travel. I'm doing a four hour drive tomorrow. And then the following day I do another four and a half hour drive. And then I fly out, then I come back and then I do another five hour drive. I mean, it's, it's relentless, but at the same time, uh, I think, you know, the sweet isn't as sweet without the bitter sometimes. <laughs> and, and we're, we're definitely grinding. Now, what advice would you have for the listeners? I, well, I mean, there's, there's been a bunch of, I, I will tell you this, uh, the resilience is probably the final attribute of a of an entrepreneur you have to have, and the self doubt or the excitement. Just manage the highs and lows with just uh, a grinding approach to growth and pivot when you need to. Uh, you know, smart be, be smart about it and think through it. You know, you're not you're not a gambler; you're a calculated risk taker. That's a that's a big piece. Um, though your your spouse may not look at it that way, but uh, <laughs> you, just to be clear, but but stick stick with it if you truly believe in it. Um, the, there is a, there's real math behind if you can make it to year three, uh, that you're like hundred percent more likely to make it to year four and five. And, and the reason is because as you've had your brand out there and you've been out there longer, people now associate with that and your, your flow of, of deals and, and your messaging and how you get, you get better at it. It's like almost like a school, right? You get by the end of it, you're better at what you're doing. So stick with it. Um, seek advice. And, and honestly, I'm, I'm pretty actually easy to get on a call, uh, because all the, you know, we don't take tons of customers, right? But when people do do a calendar, they meet with me still on our company. So I, I 
I would say I hand select, right? But we you, we find pe- good meaning in minds of people who just need help. Um, I'm happy to meet with anybody for 30 minutes to hear what challenges they have. And if I can help them, great. If not, I'll send them to somebody I know that can. Love it. In fact, you know, that's a great kind of segue. How can the listeners get a hold of you? How can they find more information about Thomas and Instantly Relevant, the new sponsor of the Shades of Entrepreneurship? Right. <laughs> right. Good brand colors. Um, just go to instantlyrelevant.com. Our site's always changing. Also, our, the Taylor's kids are almost always naked, too. We're the last ones to do our site the way we want. But that's the easy way to get a hold of it because you're going to feel for our, uh, you know, just who we are as a company a little bit. But the truth is just you schedule time that goes right to me. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, you can find me through Thomas Helfrick. That's fine as well. Uh, but uh, just just reach out. Don't be afraid to just ask and say, hey, I heard you on a – if you say you heard me on a podcast, um, I'll, I'll definitely find something fun and extra to give you just because, you know, if you made it to this point, I think that's pretty cool. And, and I, that'll, I'll make sure anybody in your audience who does that, I'll – I'll give a little something, something, some kind of cool lead magnet or something fun. In fact, if they do, if somebody reaches out to you folks, here's a little plug. If you do reach out to Thomas and you connect with him and you say you heard from the Shades of Entrepreneurship, I will send you a free sweater. Send me. So, Thomas, you let me know if any of my guests reach out to you. That's that's a free sweater coming your way. I may, I might regret this. <laughs> With you. But hey, if you've gotten this far, we will certainly give you a free sweater. Thomas, thank L- you. Again. Luckily, it's it's a weak point for me. Yeah. The follow up attribution piece. You mean. Perfect. So, yeah. that works your advantage. Up. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, what are you, I was on that show? <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> Man, that's great. Thomas, is there any last words you'd like to say for the guests? No, well, no, thank you. If you made it this far, um, and I, I mean, I, no one ever listens to all my content this far. So if they've made it this far, you rock. And Either you have a clear obsession for Gabriel or or me. Yeah, but, uh, it's one of the so two. Much. It's it's. No, probably- think, listen, I reach out, find advice, uh, keep reading, and 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 I, I love you're an entrepreneur if you're listening because we need more of them in the world. We do, and I hope this. Uh, I continue to hope this podcast. You know, as as me and Thomas have been talking about, continues to bring value to the user listeners. Again, if you made it this far, I really do hope you did because there's a lot of great content. Thomas is a very uh, informative, inf- uh, formative guy, and I would happily connect you folks with them. So please. Follow me on the Shades of E on all the social sites. You can also subscribe to the newsletter by visiting theshadesofe.com. We will also have Thomas's information on the newsletter. So again, another good reason to subscribe because you'll have all this information there. Other than that, thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.